So, ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening to all of you. Uh, this is our series of the monthly lectures. This is the series of the IWM where fellows here at the Institute present uh, their work uh, to the public. I'm very happy to welcome you for this event of tonight, for our monthly lecture of tonight. My name is Ludger Hagedorn. I'm working as a permanent fellow here at the Institute. And it is my pleasure tonight uh, to introduce to you our speaker of tonight, Marcy Shore, who is a long-term friend um, of the Institute. Um, Marcy works as a, a professor of history at uh, Yale University. Her focus within uh, this very broad topic of history is especially the intellectual and cultural history of Europe and especially of Eastern or Central Eastern Europe. Um, so of that region that is very close to the Institute and a region that is also very close to the heart of uh, Marcy Shore, I might uh, say. Um, Marcy um, has published a lot of uh, books or uh, uh, books that were uh, highly appreciated, award-winning books. I mention the three most important of them to you. Her first one, Caviar and Ashes, Warsaw Generations, Life and Death in Marxism, a book published in 2006. And it is a book that did win uh, not less than eight awards, if I'm not mistaken, maybe more in the meantime, I don't know, at least eight awards. The story of a generation of Polish intellectuals that covers or spans the years from 1918 to 1968. A uh, very important uh, 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 time span in relevance to in, in relation to the year that we are celebrating this year, 2018. So 1918, 1968, a generation, the generation of the young uh, avant-gardists of the early 20s who became the radical Marxists of the late 1920s. That is maybe the best short characterization of that book. Secondly, the taste of ashes. You see there is a certain like in Marcy's title of the word ashes. <laughs> the first, caviar and ashes. The second, the taste of ashes. Subtitle, The Afterlife of Totalitarianism in Eastern Europe. A book that is a literary examination of the ghost of communism or uh, quoting Marx more directly, one could also say of the specter of communism but not uh, the specter of communism that he announces in, in his communist manifesto that will soon uh, dominate the world and become visible in the world, but the leftovers of that uh, specter. And the leftovers, once again, in the region that I mentioned before, in the eastern and especially central eastern European regions, so from Berlin to Moscow, through Prague, Bratislava, Warsaw, Bucharest, Vilnius, Kiev, to mention a few places. <coughs> Thirdly, and that is the most recent book, I have it here with me, y The Ukrainian Night, An Intimate uh, History of Revolution, published in 2017. It is, one could say, a report on the Maidan Revolution. Marcy presented uh, the book before it actually came out. You did a presentation of this book last year, I remember, at our Humanities Festival. That was very nice. So one could say a report on the Maidan Revolution. But how to describe it uh, better? Um, it is um, history as telling stories in the very best sense of how to char characterize this. It is an intimate portrayal of the revolution from inside of the revolution, and revolution more as an, I would say, as an existential happening than a political happening. Our colleague uh, Ivan Kastev um, has said the very nice sentence. Ivan Kastev is very good at uh, <laughs> pinpointing things into very <laughs> short sentences. Has said the very nice sentence about this book, how, how to best characterize this. The best way to make sense of a revolution is to fall in love with it. And this is his characterization of Marcy's book on the Maidan revolution. The best way to make sense of a revolution is to fall in love with it. Marcy Shore. Um, has won several awards and prizes. I will not mention all of uh, them to you, just mention that this year she was awarded uh, the Guggenheim Fellowship, which is one of the most prestigious fellowships whatsoever <laughs> that one can, can win. 
And let me add on a personal note what is always very impressive to me uh, uh, when meeting Marcy and when speaking to Marcy and for those of you who have met her here at the Institute before, what is always very impressive I think is her, is her enormous talent and her enormous capability of languages and her switching from English to Polish, Czech, Russian, German, Ukrainian and so on and uh, this is a thing that I very much uh, admire in her. Currently, uh, Marcy is a junior visiting fellow at IWM, as I mentioned before, not her first stay at the IWM, but a long stay, in fact. And she, is a re she has been, over many years, a really close and good friends to the Institute, and I'm happy uh, she is back uh, at the moment. And her uh, project that she is pursuing at the Institute uh, this year is entitled Phenomenological Encounters, Scenes from Central Europe. Marcy's topic for tonight, uh, you have read it in the announcement, Understanding Post-Truth, Lessons from Central European Philosophy after 1968. I think this is already quite a telling title. So uh, I suppose what we are going to hear will have to do something with the question of how does post-truth relate to post-modernism, for example, as one question that I might, might mention. Who still believes in truth truth with a capital uh, T and hasn't everything turned into a question of PR and finally maybe the question as she once put it in an earlier article of hers in how far can we uh, take Jack, Jack Derrida as being responsible for Vladimir Putin. Marcy the floor is yours please. <coughs> Okay, hey, thank you, Ludger. Ah, and thank you all for coming. I always feel much more important after Ludger introduces me. <laughs> I'm very happy to be back here in Vienna. Wait, I don't see a baby. Is there a baby, Aga? No, you didn't bring it? Ah, okay, okay, all right. So no babies. <laughs> a disappointment, but I will be happy about the presence of the rest of you. So I'm going to begin, I think, with my last day here at the Institute five years ago, which was in some sense the moment when post-truth seeped into my consciousness as an issue or a category or a philosophical problem. And that happened not during the Maidan, but precisely at the moment that the Maidan ended. You know, and as I, I think all of you who are here know, um, that revolution climaxed with a massacre um, in February 2014. Um, there were some hundred people killed, many by snipers. The then president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, very quickly fled across the Russian border. His public relations advisor, Paul Manafort was then out of a job. I think we all know what Paul Manafort does next. Um, and then very soon, um, within weeks or even days, so-called little green men appeared in Crimea, um, it not being precisely clear exactly who the little green men were. And then the beginnings of the war in the Donbass. Um, stories that the revolution on the Maidan was a CIA-sponsored fascist coup and Ukrainian Nazis were, as we spoke, heading east to kill all the Russian speakers. In July that summer of 2014, Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down in the Donbass. And then suddenly there were various stories. It was shot down by Russian anti-aircraft um, anti equipment. Uh, it was quite clear fairly quickly um, that it was you know, separatist forces using Russian anti-aircraft equipment that did it. But stories multiplied very quickly. Perhaps it was the Ukrainian army. Perhaps it was part of an assassination attempt on Vladimir Putin and the conspirators believed him to be on the plane. 
you know, perhaps those bodies of the nearly 300 people who were on that flight, all of whom were killed, were not really people who had been alive when they got on the flight. Perhaps it was all part of a CIA conspiracy which involved stuffing that plane with dead bodies um, that then landed on the, de on the Donbass. About six months later, um, Peter Pomerantsev's book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, came out right around the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Um, and that was, you know, while it was a book that was written in some sense in a lighthearted tone, um, somewhat gossipy and voyeuristic, it was, I thought, one of the most philosophically perceptive texts that we had up to that moment about what was going on in Putin's Russia. And Peter says there that what was happening in Russia was a general mood or attitude to consider everything PR. Everything is PR. Um, it no longer was true that something was true and something was false, but everything was simply a matter of one's perspective of it, of one's position on it, of how you pitched it, you know, of how you marketed it. Everything could be marketed in different ways. There were a plethora of rays, as, as we know, our, all of us being enlightened postmodern people. Um, and I, I read that book with great fascination an attempt to understand better what was happening in Russia and Ukraine. And then almost before you know, I had a chance to take that in, it somehow seemed that this attitude of everything is PR and there no longer being a distinction between reality and reality television had appeared on my own side of the Atlantic. You know, then, then came the, the presidential campaign, you know, beginning with the Republican debates among the candidates who were running for president. Um, and the New Yorker satire about the fact checker who passed out from exhaustion at the end of one of those Republican debates. Um, and then came the kind of nightmarish presidential campaign of, of Donald Trump, you know, and, and various stories that suddenly appeared you know, including that Hillary Clinton was kidnapping children to exploit for child pornography and hiding them in the cellar of a pizzeria in Washington. Um, in fact, millions of Americans believe this story. Um, some guy with a semi-automatic weapon comes into the pizzeria and starts shooting people to liberate the children. Arguably that story swings the election, but it was only one of many stories that were milling about. And so yes, but perhaps there was a perhaps there was a, a tape in which Trump, you know, admits to assaulting women, but perhaps Hillary Clinton is kidnapping children and hiding them in the cellar of, of a pizza restaurant in Washington. And really one never knows because anything is possible. And, and this was 2016 when the Oxford Dictionary declared post-truth to be the word of the year. And suddenly we were in the world um, of, of what was then called alternative facts, um, as Kellyanne Conway, who works for Trump, said. We have alternative facts. Suddenly, in fact, nothing was true, but everything could be said. You know, you know Trump claim that, that Obama tapped his phones, that the Democrats were the ones making him separate families on the border, that the, there were between three and five million illegal votes cast, which cost him the popular vote, that he had always been against the invasion of Iraq. Um, he would say things like, you look at what's happening in Germany, you look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden, who would believe this? Well, what was happening last night in Sweden? I mean, you might think there had been a terror attack in Sweden. In fact, as far as we know, nothing was happening the previous night in Sweden. It was just something he said. Um, and one of my favorite examples from uh, February 2017 on African American History Month, when he talked about um, the, the abolitionist Frederick Douglass as an example of someone who's done an amazing job um, asked to clarify, Sean Spicer, the White House press secretary, said, I think he wants to highlight the contributions that he has made, and I think through a lot of the actions and statements that he's going to make, I think the contributions of Frederick Douglass will become more and more. 
And, and that, that, sound, that sounds great. It's all a matter of opinion. I, I, unless you happen to know that Frederick Douglass was a 19th century abolitionist who died in 1895. Um, that, that's the summer of 2016 um, in Ostrava, Andrei Zubov, a Russian historian who in March 2014 had compared Putin's annexation of Crimea to Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland in 1938, spoke in Ostrava. And he said in his kind of booming baritone, this is now after he's been fired um, from the university where he worked in Russia. He said before this audience in, in Czech Ostrava, me dalžny gavarit pravdu. We should speak the truth. And when he said that, as it kind of resounded and echoed through that big auditorium, it sounded almost quaint, a little bit old fashioned. Me dalžny gavarit pravdu. But, but who, who believed in truth anymore? I mean, it was certainly passé. Um, so what I, I wanted to talk about today, or what I was asked to talk about today, um, which I think is something probably a lot of you have been thinking about and already have your own thoughts about, um, is, is where post-truth comes from, you know, and how the intellectual history of Europe in general and Eastern Europe in particular and kind of help us to understand some kind of the history of post-truth and perhaps how we got here and how we might grapple with it. And, and I want to go back to the place that I like to go back to when I, I teach modern intellectual history at Yale with my students, which is to the Enlightenment. And I try to I try to explain why that feels like it was such a big break in time. Why do historians of Europe tend to date modernity from 1789 and the storming of the Bastille? Um, why does that seem as such a kind of rupture? And I, I try to describe enlightenment you know, as the beginning of a long attempt to replace God. You know, in the beginning, of course, in the 18th century, certainly in the 17th century, um, God was not actually entirely killed off. God was just kind of sidelined. He was pushed to the margins. Um, he was demoted. He was emasculated, um, you could say. Um, he was still there, but he was sent off stage. There were ideas that, yes, you know, God is wonderful and he created the world. But then he probably kind of stepped back and let us on our own, so maybe we should think about what we're going to do with it now. Um, but the idea was that you move God off stage so that you can move human reason onto center stage. And it was not a mournful moving God aside. It was actually a very cheerful, optimistic, empowering moving God aside. It was a kind of exaltation and celebration of the power of human reason. Now, it, admittedly, you know, it's not easy to replace God. I mean, God is multifunctional. You know, God simultaneously serves epistemological, ontological, and ethical functions. God guarantees, you know, our, our knowledge that we can know the world. God guarantees our being. God guarantees a sense of morality. So once you push God aside, you've really got, you've got a lot of room to fill. Um, and the idea was that human reason would be up to the task, that human reason could develop itself that our knowledge of the world could get better and better. And the question, in some sense, was can we get to truth without God? What guarantees a certainty of the world? How do we know what's real? How do we know what's really there? How do I know that this glass is really here and it's not just a projection of my consciousness? How do I cross that bridge from inner to outer, from subject to object, from mind to world, from consciousness to being? How do I know it's really there if there isn't God to tell me that he put me in this world for a reason and I can know it's there? Um, and, and Descartes famously inaugurates modern philosophy with this question and with this radical experiment um, in which he tries to 
purge himself of any kind of preconceived knowledge and try to figure out what can he know relying on no, no initial presumptions whatsoever. Um, and Descartes says, well, how can, I, how can I know if my thoughts correspond to reality? I, I, I have thoughts. I, I, I know I see things in my mind. I think I see things. But maybe what I think I see was really something put in my mind by an evil demon. How do I know? Of what can I be sure? Where can I start? Of what can I be sure? And Descartes finally then famously comes to the, the idea that what he can really be sure of, assuming nothing, is that he is having thoughts and therefore he exists. And this is where you get the famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Now eventually, at the end of his long experiments, um, Descartes cheats, in my opinion, and brings God back. Um, you know, and, and really the whole challenge of the Enlightenment game is to get there without God. You know, and, and after all that time of moving God aside, finally Dostoevsky speculatively and then Nietzsche definitively kills off God. Um, and then you really are kind of left there and have to find another road to truth. This problem of the bridge, um, epistemology as first philosophy, the first question being how can we know the world, um, then comes to dominate philosophy for a very long time. You know, Kant famously in his essay, What is Enlightenment, which wins not first but second prize in the famous What is Enlightenment essay contest, um, the first prize went to Moses Mendelssohn, who also wrote a very nice essay. But today, all these years later, it's certainly Kant's essay that is, has come to be more influential. Uh, Kant defined enlightenment as the exit from immaturity. The slogan was sapere auda, have the courage to use your own understanding. You have to get there. You have to reach the world. You have to figure out what the truth is using your own reason, using your own understanding. And again, there was this cheerful optimism because underlying Kant's essay was the Obama-like, yes, we can. You know, yes, we can use our own reason. Now that said, and despite the fact that I kind of personally, my own feeling about Kant is that he was a cheerful, optimistic person. I'm not a Kant expert, and obviously I didn't know him personally. But I don't see him as a tragic, sad figure. But later, Hannah Arendt will describe Kant's philosophy about as that which ultimately leaves us with the melancholy mood of modern philosophy. Because ultimately, at the end of Kant's epistemology, he gets to the point where he says, yes, there is a real world out there. I believe it exists. I'm a realist. I'm an epistemological realist. I believe that there is a world that is independent of my mind, that it is not just a projection of my consciousness, that there are things in themselves. There's a ding an sich. There's reality as exists in itself. But Kant says, we have no access to that ding an sich. We don't have any access to the world as it exists in itself. We only have access to the world as it appears to us. And so Kant says we should probably stop you know, spending our time trying to talk about that ding an sich because we can't get there anyway. And we should start trying to understand exhaustively how the world appears to us and how we understand the world. And then he writes very, very long books about that. Um, uh, Krzysztof Michalski, the, the founder and longtime rector of this institute, um, used to describe to me the ding an sich as, as this, this empty concept. I mean, basically, it's nothing because it's reality as it's not known. And since you can't know it, since you can't get there, it's useless, it's empty. We can't do anything with it. You know, it's precisely you know, that, which, that with which nothing can be done. Um, 
So then Hannah Arendt goes on to say um, in her essay, What is Existential Philosophy? After Kant severs the connection decisively between subject and object, between consciousness and being, mind and world, leaving us with this melancholy fatalism, and she says this even though she loves Kant, um, Hegel makes the last great attempt to put it all back together again. The particular and the universal, the individual and the world, being and thought, the subject and the object, he, he sweeps it all back together again. And he does this by using history. He does this by making things move. He does this by introducing Geist um, and history with the capital H. And everything is kind of moving towards this ultimate synthesis, moving in a kind of edgy way. You know, not necessarily smoothly, but moving. Um, and yet, Hannah Arendt says, nobody could be sure whether Hegel's attempt to reconstitute a world now shattered into pieces left us with a residence or a prison for reality. And Hegel begins phenomenology of spirit with the claim, das wahre ist das ganze, the true is the whole. And in some sense, at least to me as a historian and not a philosopher who probably doesn't understand all sorts of more detailed and particular things about Hegel, which I'm sure Ligger, for instance, does um, and will someday explain to me, that das wahre ist das ganze arguably is the source of the enormous seduction of Hegel. It's often believed that the great seduction of Hegel was the history with the capital H, was the teleology, was history moving inevitably, inexorably forward. And that was admittedly very seductive. But the other part of that seduction was the wholeness, the idea that everything could be swept together in this kind of seamless way. Mary Gluck, in her book about the young Georg Lukács, in describing his kind of path ultimately towards Hegel, writes about his hunger for wholeness, how that gap you know, between subject and object, between consciousness and being, he suffered over it, that people wanted everything to come together. The fragmentation was unbearable. Um, and Hegel gives us not only teleology, but also wholeness. And then as we move from Hegel through the 20th century, we get these grand narratives that promise us wholeness. We get nation and class as keys to new grand narratives that pull everything together, that guarantee truth and guarantee meaning. We get 20th century totalitarian ideologies, which of course are lies, but there are lies, and this is what Arendt teaches us, that are so seductive in large part because they are more consistent than reality. And I want to now go back and walk you through a little bit about how Hannah Arendt understands the role of truth and lies in the context of 20th century totalitarianism. And in her essay, Truth and Politics, she begins by making a distinction between two kinds of truth. And that's what philosophers will often call a priori truth, truth prior to experience, and a posteriori truth, or truth that comes after the fact of experience. So a priori truth, rational truth, is the kind of truth that you can get to without doing anything, just using your own mind. And that tends to be mathematical. You know, two plus two equals four, even if you don't test it, even if you don't count M&Ms. Um, you, you, the, the, the angles of a triangle or the circumference of a circle or all of those mathematical calculations, they are prior to experience. You don't have to wait for something to happen. You know, they exist as rational truths, a priori truths. But then there are empirical truths, factual truths, truths that are true because something happened. So Arendt gives the example of the fact that Germany invaded Belgium in 1914. Now, no law of physics or mathematics necessitated that in 1914 Germany would invade Belgium. 
It's not a rational truth. It's not an a priori truth. It's an a posteriori truth. It's true because it happened. It's a fact that took place. It's an empirical truth. And she says it's really it's empirical truths that are so vulnerable to political manipulation. Because, she says, empirical truth always bears the vulnerability of its original contingency because it did not have to happen. You didn't have to miss your train. You, know, you didn't have to spill the coffee. Germany did not have to invade Belgium. Um, it always could have been different. And because of that vulnerability of its original contingency, the liar always has the opportunity to sound much more logical and persuasive than the truth teller, because in real life, all kinds of stupid, random, arbitrary, unlikely things happen all the time. So Arendt writes in Truth and Politics, for facts have no conclusive reason whatsoever for being what they are. They could always have been otherwise. And this annoying contingency is literally unlimited. It is because of the haphazardness of facts that pre-modern philosophy refused to take seriously the realm of human affairs, which is permeated by factuality, or to believe that any meaningful truth could ever be discovered in what Kant calls the melancholy haphazardness of a sequence of events which constitutes the course of this world. So the liar, Arendt, says, always has this advantage, this opportunity to be more persuasive than the truth teller. Now she goes on to make a distinction between what she calls the old-fashioned lie, you know, the pre-totalitarian lie. And she says the old-fashioned lie was like a tear in the fabric of reality. You know, and the reality is sewn back together by the liar, sometimes very well but still in such a way that the historian or the careful observer can detect the spot where something was torn and sewn back together, because there is always a seam. 20th century totalitarianism, she says, saw a new kind of lie. This kind of lie, she said, was no longer a tear in the fabric of reality. This kind of lie was a total reconstruction of reality in such a way as to be seamless. So there was no more seam to perceive. And these ideologies were so persuasive because they eliminate the contingency of everyday life. They tie everything together. They feed the hunger for wholeness. They can make the world consistent and logical even if that world they make consistent and logical is false. She writes, the contingent character of acts, which could always have been otherwise, and which therefore possess by themselves no trace of self-evidence or plausibility for the human mind. Since the liar is free to fashion his facts to fit the profit and pleasure, or even the mere expectations of his audience, the chances are that he will be more persuasive than the truth teller. Indeed, he will usually have plausibility on his side. His exposition will sound more logical, as it were, since the element of unexpectedness has mercifully disappears. And she tells this story from the point of view of the masses, in particular, the masses under Nazism and Stalinism in Origins of Totalitarianism when she tries to explain why these grand narratives, these ideologies that were elaborate, seamless, holistic reconstructions of reality were so efficacious. In Origins of Totalitarianism, she writes, what the masses refuse to recognize is the fortuitousness that pervades reality. They are predisposed to all ideologies because they explain facts as mere examples of laws and eliminate coincidences by inventing an all-embracing omnipotence, which is supposed to be at the root of every accident. Totalitarian propaganda thrives on this escape from reality into fiction, from coincidence into consistency. Totalitarian movements conjure up a lying world of consistency which is more adequate to the needs of the human mind than reality itself. Uprooted masses can feel at home. 
and are spared the never-ending shocks which real life and real experiences deal to human beings. So the price of this wholeness, of this consistency, of this being provided with holistic truth and holistic meaning was lies. Um, and, and of course, not only lies, because the, the legacy of the 20th century and these totalitarian experiments was both the enormity of the experiment and the enormity of the failure. Um, you know, between 1933 and 1945, um, Hitler and Stalin managed to kill some 14 million civilians just between the Baltic and the Black Seas alone. But you all know all that. Um, so let me move on. I want to now move on to 1968, in particular since we're celebrating, or perhaps celebrating isn't the right word, but we're commemorating this year the 50th anniversary of 1968. As a moment which arguably in both halves of Europe, certainly in communist Eastern Europe, was the beginning of the end of Marxism. And Marxism was arguably the last grand narrative. Afterwards, no big grand narratives come on the scene very quickly to replace it. Postmodernism is a response to this absence or this lack of faith in grand narratives. It was defined famously by the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard as incredulity towards meta-narratives. And if modernity was a long, complicated attempt to replace God, Postmodernity arguably begins at the moment when we give up on trying to replace God. When we accept that no longer is there any God, but moreover there is also no ersatz God, no surrogate God, no concept, you know, no first principle, nothing that is going to fill in for God. When you face truly God's death with eyes wide open, no, there's no God and there is no possible substitute. In 1848, when Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto said all that is solid melts into air, they were actually being quite precocious and premature. It was not true in 1848. In the mid-19th century, the observation was premature. But by the end of the 20th century, it no longer was. The Polish philosopher Zygmunt Bauman, who begins his life very much as a believer in Marxism, will later describe modernity as an attempt to replace pre-modern solids with something still more solid and lasting. Afterwards, post-modernity he would call liquid modernity, which aspires not to replace solids with better solids, but rather to melt the solids. It no longer searches for firm grounding, but embraces liquidity, slipperiness, uncertainty. And I want to now take you from postmodernism in general into poststructuralism more specifically, because I think that's where we get the most poignant insight um, into the origins of post-truth. So in the 1960s, um, one of, the, one of the ideas to come on the scene, even as Marxism was faltering, was structuralism. And this was the idea that it's not history necessarily with a capital H, you know, or it's not a nation or a class or an individual that is guaranteeing truth or holding meaning in place, but rather a structure. And structuralism more generally comes from linguistic structuralism in particular. You know, and, and in particular, it, it dates to a, a fin de siècle, a Swiss linguist named Ferdinand de Saussure, um, who, who didn't even really write his, his own book. His lecture notes were published posthumously by his very devoted students. And in, that, in those lecture notes, there are a few key ideas. And, and the one that's most relevant is this idea that the connection between what he calls the signifier and the signified, 
which in layperson's terms is the word and the thing it represents. So the word tree and that like actual thing outside, or the word dog and that furry creature running around. The connection between the signifier and the signified, Sisor says, is arbitrary. Or he calls it unmotivated. And we know it's arbitrary because in all these different languages of the world, there are all these different languages, there are all these different words for the same thing. Because we know that there are many, many different words you know, for that furry creature that we call a dog in English, and a hund in German, and a, a pes in, in, in Czech, you know, and a pies in Polish, and a you know, tsobachka in Russian. I mean, you can keep going. So the link between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. There's no particular reason why this particular set of sounds or letters has to represent that thing. There's no reason at all. But, Sisor says, that doesn't mean that tomorrow we might wake up and all the words in a given language will be changed. No, they don't just move around like that. Because the structure of a language holds that meaning in place. So while the original connection created at a moment nobody has ever really experienced in conscious memory was arbitrary, the connection, the meaning is nonetheless stable because language is a structure that holds things in place. Meaning is held in place by a structure. So meaning is not inherent. There's nothing inherent in the word dog that makes it mean that furry creature. But it's still, it's relational, not inherent. But it's still stable. It's still fixed. It's still solid enough that you can hold on to it. And then Jacques Derrida comes along and says, OK, but in order to hold meaning stable, the structure has to be closed. There has to be borders. It's the borders of a language that hold things in place. It's the borders of a structure that hold things in place. And Derrida says, but this is an illusion, because there's no such thing as a closed structure. Because life goes on, so to speak. Life is always going on. The structure is never closed. Moreover, Derrida says, the structure can never be closed because in order for a structure to really be fixed and stable and closed, you need God or you need an ersatz God. You need what Derrida calls a transcendental signified. You need some kind of unifying first principle that holds everything in place. It has to be God or a substitute. It, it needs a center, it needs a grounding point, um, a way to limit what would otherwise be the endless play of signifiers and signifiers and signifieds. There has to be, Derrida writes, a transcendental signified for the difference between signifier and signified to be somewhere absolute and irreducible. But, he says, this center, this transcendental signified, is precisely what is missing what does not and cannot exist. And the absence of this transcendental signified then extends the domain and play of signification infinitely. Um, and Derrida comes up with various concepts, one of which is what he calls différence in, in French, and I won't even pretend to speak French. Um, but what différence does is allow him to move on both a kind of synchronic and diachronic axis. And he says différence represents both difference and deferral. So meaning is never either horizontally self-identical on a, on a synchronic plane, nor is it ever vertically self-identical you know, on a diachronic plane. It's always different. It's always both different and deferred and still to come. There's always something left over, something still to come. Um, and, and because there's no God and there's no ersatz God holding a structure closed and fixed, all of these signifiers, all of these meanings sub subvert themselves. They contain within themselves elements that are in tension with one another, that negate one another. Meaning is never self-identical. It's fluid. It's in flux. It's incomplete. It's self-undermining. It's different from what it had been a moment before, and it's still to come. So the relationship between words and things is never fixed because signifiers are always playing with one another. So there can be no once and for all determinate truth or determinate meaning or determinate self, for that matter. Life is constant movement. It's not, life is not a closed structure. There are no closed structures. Now for Derrida, this idea of play, the idea of the play released by the absence of a closed structure was liberating. 
It was creative, it was, it was freeing. It was an embrace of plurality, of heterogeneity. Um, and, and Derrida, I, 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 who I, I don't want to certainly hold consciously responsible for Vladimir Putin, and I, so I want to emphasize this point, I do not think he was cavalier at all or indifferent to moral concerns. I mean, on the contrary. I think, and this is just my own reading of Derrida, and you feel free to disagree with me, I think he deeply believed that a refusal of all claims to absolute truth was what would protect us from totalitarian terror in the future that it was those claims to absolute and eternal meaning that left us vulnerable to totalitarian ideologies, and that the space for play that he asserted and embraced was precisely that space for freedom, for creativity, for heterogeneity. Play, and, and, and Derrida loves the word play, it was not meant, I, to the extent that I can speak as if I were inside his head, which of course I can't, but I don't, he did not mean it to trivialize our lives and our relationship to the world. I think he meant it to affirm our creativity and our freedom. De deconstruction, you know, his own philosophy, Derrida said, has always represented the least necessary condition for identifying and combating the totalitarian risk. And, and what I want to emphasize here is that this post, both Derrida's deconstruction and his idea of post-structuralism in particular and postmodernism in general was in large part inspired by the deeply moral desire never again to fall prey to those grand narratives, to those seamless reconstructions of reality, to those claims of absolute truth. This idea that meaning, truth, the self, subjectivity, that they all flicker and they are fluid um, was meant as an affirmation of our freedom against claims to absolute truth, our space for self-creation and self-recreation. You know, so Derrida has been accused of nihilism, but for Derrida, it's not that there was no meaning. There was infinite meaning. It's not that there was too little. There was too much. Um, that, and deconstruction for him was political in the good sense. It was an antidote to the way of thinking that led us to Nazism and Stalinism. So of course this, this fluidity, this openness to infinite possibilities, the sense that the self can be created and recreated, that it need not to be the same as what it was yesterday or what it will be tomorrow, um, this freedom was also of course an unhinging because it then leaves us with no stable ground, this condition that Arendt calls bodenlosigkeit, this kind of groundlessness. Because if, real, if there is no determinate truth, if reality is only constructed by discourse, well, the meanings of whose signifiers are constantly in flux, composed of signifiers always at play with one another, then does any, any reality exist that we should feel attached to, that we should invest in, that we should depend upon, that we should care deeply about? And so are infinite meanings and infinite truths in effect equivalent to no meaning and, and no truth? And, and this fear of nihilism, this fear that there would be nothingness was very much a fear that motivated a lot of philosophy that was happening. And now I'm going to move from France to Eastern Europe under communism after 1968, in the time when people agreed that nobody believed in communism anymore, but it wasn't clear that there was going to be anything else to believe in to replace it. And this, this fear of nothingness you know, this nothingness, this nihilism, Václav Havel would describe as the modern face of the devil. But before I, I jump into Eastern Europe in the last few minutes, um, I want to I, I, I kind of go back and clarify this, the distinction between epistemological realism and this world of post-truth in which everything is PR. And emphasize again the point that postmodernism, which was created in large part by the left as a safeguard for pluralism and an antidote to totalitarian ideologies, has today, half a century later, you know, become a weapon of an encroaching neo-totalitarianism of the right. And again, this is not you know, to make people think that you know, Derrida should be hanged in effigy or anything like that. It's just an attempt to understand this new world in which everything is true.
in which nothing is true and everything is possible, in which there's no longer a distinction between reality and reality television. There, there's a book that recently came out that I want to mention here in this, this context, because I'm not sure it's gotten enough attention, by a, a Russian-American anthropologist named Natalia Rudakova called Losing Pravda, um, Ethics and the Press in Post-Truth Russia. And she makes a very interesting argument that you know, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to decisively evaluate, but I find it very provocative. Um, and she says that, in fact, epistemological realism actually survived Soviet times. You know, that really, even at a time, or certainly in the last couple decades of the Soviet Union, people still believed in reality. It did not survive, Rodakova argues, the wild capitalism of the 1990s. And, and she makes an argument that Russian journalists having to, were faced with the need to self-monetize, um, which led to a kind of privileging of pathos over sincerity. Um, she calls it journalism's headlong collision with capitalism. As journalists began to think of themselves, she says, as merchants of pathos and members of the second oldest profession. She argues that this led to a decrease in the value of truth-seeking as such. By the time, she writes, Putin began to consolidate his influence. Manipulation of public opinion was expected. Indignation about it was absent. It was no longer news. And, and I, I, want to, I want to, again, kind of to in part to clarify Natalia's argument here, this idea that epistemological realism actually survived in those last decades of the Soviet Union. Um, so there is, and I'm, go I'm going to tell this story by way of an anecdote about a famous Polish film called Czesłuchania, The Interrogation. And this was a film made during the time of Solidarity, 1980, I think it was released in 1981. It's also, as far as I know, the only time that Agnieszka Holland appears on the other side of the camera. She actually makes a cameo appearance in this film. Um, it is one of the best films ever made about Stalinism. In the film, Krystyna Janda, a very famous Polish actress, um, plays Tanya, who is a young nightclub singer in post-war Stalinist Poland. Tanya is arrested unexpectedly, thrown into prison, accused of being the lover of a Western imperialist spy. She initially doesn't understand what's going on. She thinks it must be a mistake. She denies everything. She can't understand what they're talking about. The director keeps us in that prison cell with Tanya for two hours as she is tortured and interrogated again and again, you know, until finally and gradually she admits to more and more of the interrogator's versions of the story, although never to the whole thing in its entirety. At the end of the film, you never find out what actually happened. You never find out which of these many men who are mentioned had actually been her lover. You never find out if any of those men had actually been a spy. And if so, if she had known about it. We don't know. It ends with epistemological unclarity. We don't get to the truth. But it doesn't end with ontological unclarity. Because we are given to understand at the end of that film that there is a reality. There is a real version of events. The fact that we don't access it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That difference between truth and lies remains even when you're being told a false story. Um, and I think this is part of what Natalia Rudakova is trying to explain that this, even if Russians were told lots of false stories in those last decades of communism, that doesn't mean they gave up on believing in truth as such and mass. That, she argues, happened only afterwards. That home happens only after in post-Soviet times. It's a very provocative argument, and it's a new book, so I wanted to throw it out there. Um, and, and the world that Peter Pomerantsev describes and what I fear that then also came to our side of the Atlantic is a world in which there's not only epistemological unclarity, but, but also ontological clarity, in which it's not only that we know we're not getting a real version of events, but people give up on believing that there is such a thing as a real version of events. Well, maybe the body was stuffed, maybe the plane was stuffed with bodies, you know, or you know, maybe it was an assassination attempt, or maybe this, or maybe that, or who really knows? because anything is possible, and you just kind of give up. 
Um, and this is what, what poor um, Obama was struggling with in his Johannesburg speech when he was trying to talk about how do you negotiate solutions and methods for dealing of global warming when people are saying, oh, but that's a left-wing conspiracy. Like, oh, that's something Obama made up. And Obama is saying like, well, if I say this is a podium and you say it's an elephant, well, where do we start? We don't have any place to start because anything can then be pulled out of the air. Um, and, and of course, this is amusing, but, it, but it's not innocuous. I mean, what, what has now been happening in, in the Donbass you know, for the past four and a half years is that people are being killed every day in reality for reasons that are fiction. Um, I, our friend, uh, Zhenya Monasterski, who was here uh, for a, a post-truth conference that Ludger and I and Tanya and Kate organized a year or so ago, his brother was just shot this weekend fighting on the front. Um, and, and fortunately, due to a, a bulletproof vest, seems to have survived. He's now recovering from surgery in the hospital in Dnipro. But let me now, now move to a possible antidote for post-truth. Let me go back to Eastern Europe after 1968 and this fear of nihilism and the search for truth as a struggle against nihilism, which was seen as the most threatening form of alienation after the death of faith in Marxism. In 1975, you have the Helsinki Accords. And the Helsinki Accords, you know, although they involved you know, countries signing and agreeing to human rights, which they never intended to honor, were nevertheless of enormous significance, um, among other reasons, because they introduced a new vocabulary, a universal vocabulary of human rights, which was meant to be above empirical and contingent facts. Um, on January 1st, 1977, um, a human rights document called Charter 77 was released, which described itself as a loose, informal, and open association of people of various shades of opinion, faiths, and professions, united by the will to strive individually and collectively for the respecting of civic and human rights in our own country and throughout the world. And there were three spokespeople for that original version of the petition. Um, which was Václav Havel, Jerzy Hayek, um, and the philosopher Jan Patochka. Now, very quickly, after January 1st, 1977, when that petition announced itself, um, the, the secret police came for the first set of signatories, as everybody who signed it knew that they would. Um, Jan Patochka was elderly, he was in poor health, he does not survive the interrogations. He dies in March 1977. Shortly after his death, um, Václav Havel, who wasn't so great at taking care of his health himself, um, and a fellow dissident across the border in Poland, Adam Miknik, who also has never been so great at taking care of his own health, um, both did this remarkable thing, um, which is remarkable if you know anything about them, which is they climbed a mountain. <laughs> um, they climbed this mountain called Snieżka um, on the, the Czechoslovak-Polish border you know, with several of their friends, you know, and it was the first famous meeting of the Czechoslovak and the Polish dissidents on this mountain. And uh, Havel also even carried a bottle of vodka like up, up the mountain in his backpack. Um, and, and it was from those conversations that they had on that mountain with Adam Miknik speaking in Polish and Václav Havel speaking in Czech um, that Adam Miknik persuaded Havel to write the essay that then appeared um, via an anonymous courier at the door of Adam's apartment in Warsaw a few months later. And that was called The Power of the Powerless, and it was dedicated to the memory of Jan Patochka. Um, and the main character of The Power of the Powerless um, is the green grocer. Um, and the green grocer is, and I'm sure many of you know this story, it's probably the most famous and most important text to come out of dissident thought. Um, and I think it's very well worth revisiting today. The green grocer goes into his shop every morning and he puts the sign in his window saying, Workers of the World Unite. 
Why does he put the sign in the window, Havel asked. Is it his sincere, spontaneous desire to acquaint the passers-by with his socialist enthusiasm? No, of course it's not, Havel says. I mean, by, by 1978, nobody believes in socialism anymore. Nobody believes that workers around the world are going to unite anymore. The green grocer doesn't believe it. The people who see the sign don't believe it. Even the communist regime doesn't believe it. I mean, the communist regime was like Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, who has only one secret. He does not believe in God. Even the communist regime no longer believed in Marxism. Moreover, the regime knew that the people didn't believe, and the people knew that the regime knew that they knew, and everybody knew that everybody knew, but nonetheless, everybody goes on pretending. Um, and, and Havel says, well, well, why does everybody go on with this game of pretending? Why is everybody living a lie? And Havel says, well, what else? What choice does the greengrocer have? Say, because if one day he decides to take down that sign, say he like hides it at the bottom of a box of rotten tomatoes, what will happen? And Havel says, well, somebody could notice. Somebody could report on him. The police could question him. If he continues to refuse, they could threaten that his children won't be admitted to university. They could take away his right to go on vacation. Eventually, they could detain him. They could interrogate him. They could imprison him. So really, what choice does he have but to hang the sign that everybody knows is a lie and everybody knows not to believe in? And Havel says, well, the thing is, why would all these bad things happen to the green grocer if he takes down the sign when nobody believes in the sign anyway and everybody knows that nobody else believes? Havel says, well, it seems that, you know, despite the fact that everybody knows that everybody knows that nobody believes, the sign is somehow very important to the regime. And we know that because if one day all the green grocers were to take down their signs, that would be the beginning of a revolution. Therefore, the green grocer is not so powerless after all. Because he is powerful, he is also responsible and therefore guilty, for it's the green grocers who allow the game to go on in the first place. Havel then says that he is guilty, the greengrocer is, is guilty of a failure to live in truth. He is guilty by that failure to live in truth of sustaining the very system that oppresses him. And that, in fact, we are all guilty because the line between victim and oppressor runs de facto through each one of us for everyone in his or her own way is both the victim and a supporter of the system. Now, living a lie, Havel here insists, does not make the truth go away. It only demoralizes the person who is living an inauthentic life. And this is the assertion that resists the postmodernist turn. Because no amount of propaganda or blind ritual or bad faith can dissolve the ontologically real distinction between truth and lies. And in some sense, for Havel, the ontological reality of truth is proven by contrast with the ontological reality of lies. When confronted with lies that you know to be lies, you then understand by contrast that there is such a thing as truth. And, and pravda, truth, was the first word I learned in Czech. In fact, it was the first word that I learned in any Slavic language. Uh, and, and Ludger has heard me talk about this. It has stuck in my mind because I subsequently spent the rest of my adult life struggling to learn Slavic languages and having nightmares about needing to call an ambulance and mixing up the Slavic languages. Um, and I continue to mix them up to this day. But that word pravda, what struck me about it when I first showed up in 1993 and started to talk to people who signed Charter 77 is that they used it as if it were solid, as if it were a thing, as if it were real, as if it were like an apple or a pen or, or a watch or your keys or you could hold it or you could put it in your pocket, that there was such a thing as truth. I had never heard anyone talk about truth that way, the solidity of truth. Now, the philosophical move here is that you insist on the ontologically real distinction between truth and lies, um, and that these epistemological questions are always already ethical questions. You know, that, that the failure to stand by truth and to recognize truth is a moral failure. It's not merely an epistemological failure. And, and I want to now, and, and I know I'm talking for too long, and I'm, I'm going to shut up very quickly, I promise. I want to now make this connection between truth and subjectivity, because I think this is the second important part of the, the philosophical move that happens in Eastern Europe. So the green grocer, in fact, lives two lies. The first lie is that he pretends to believe in communism. 
But the second lie is the lie he tells to himself about his own powerlessness. Because as we know now, the greengrocer is not so powerless after all. And that self-deception is the bad faith in which the greengrocer lives. And Adam Miknik, at the same time, introduces you know, into Polish dissident discourse the word podmiotowość, which means subjectivity. Um, and, a, and just like truth was, was kind of solid and real and you can hold it, Adam introduces podmiotowość, like it's something solid and real and you can hold it, like there is a subject, there is a human subject who is a responsible agent. Um, and he had this idea that he called as if. And it was not a descriptive as if. It was not like we're living as if we pretend to admire the emperor's new clothes. It was a normative as if. It was as if we should live as if we were free subjects, autonomous and bearing responsibility for our actions regardless of any social, economic, or political constraints. We live as if we were full autonomous subjects. And we bore responsibility for that solidity of our subjectivity. And the move here is that the self bears responsibility regardless of constraints. And this, I think, is the real meaning of the famous sentence um, that Havel tells the American Congress, which is even funnier when you think about the American Congress today. Um, when Václav Havel comes to Washington in February 1990 as the first president of post-communist Czechoslovakia, he gives a speech before a joint session of the Congress, the House and the Senate. And he stands up there, and just think about the intelligence level of our politicians. He stands up there and says, Consciousness precedes being, and not the other way around, as the Marxists claim. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that, I mean, chances are nobody remembered that moment in German ideology where Marx and Engels talk about how being precedes consciousness, and how you think who you are subjectively is just derivative of your you know, material position in the socioeconomic order. But how I understand what Havel claims by consciousness precedes being is that there is a self that is not merely derivative of some kind of material position in a socioeconomic structure. There is a self that is prior. There is a self that bears responsibility regardless of constraints. Consciousness precedes being. The legacy that I think is relevant for today is this idea that a robust subjectivity is not what dissolves truth, but in fact is a precondition for truth. And truth and subjectivity you know, in dissident thought, and here I'm going to kind of generalize about Eastern Europe in the 70s and 80s, is linked through responsibility. The key normative concept was responsibility, and that was what linked truth and subjectivity. In the Charter 77 Declaration, which is very short, it says, responsibility for the maintenance of rights in our country naturally devolves in the first place on the political and state authorities, yet not only on them. Everyone bears his share of responsibility for the conditions that prevail. Havel goes on to say, Patochka used to say that the most interesting thing about responsibility is that we carry it with us everywhere. That means that responsibility is ours, that we must accept it and grasp it here and now. And so what is to be done? In, in an essay called, um, what, Call, in an essay called uh, so, so, um, uh, what, what is the Sense of History? What is the English title of it? So, Yaki um, what, what is the meaning of history? What is the meaning of history? Um, and then the third heretical essay that Jan Patoshka writes, um, in fact, that he was prompted to write by, by Krzysztof Michalski, and which was then originally published in Krzysztof's Polish translation, the journal Znak. Patochka insists that even if there is no such thing as meaning that is out there in some kind of pre-made, reified form ready for us to pick up like a pen, we nonetheless have a responsibility to look for it. That, that meaning is active, meaning is a seeking. And the seeking of meaning and the seeking of truth is our responsibility. Humans cannot live without meaning, Patochka wrote. But perhaps while the truth could not be had, it could and must be sought. You have to keep looking. Um, 
And this was something that was very close to what the Polish philosopher Kowalkowski said when he wrote about Husserl. He said, OK, this idea that you can find finally a bridge from subject to object, from consciousness to being, from mind to world, that you can get to absolute truth, that you can get to epistemological clarity. Probably Husserl's attempt failed because all such attempts will fail because there is no bridge. There is no bridge to absolute truth. But he said, you've got to put that aside and you've got to keep looking because the seeking of truth is a moral responsibility. Um, because epistemological questions are always already ethical questions. So this idea of a robust subjectivity, a subject who is responsible for seeking truth, doesn't, doesn't preclude the possibility of an ontologically real truth. It's a precondition for the existence of an ontologically real truth. So you need to posit both a real subject and real truth. And that return to the subject, which is a return to movement, is not a kind of the solidity of the subject melting into air. It doesn't relativize truth. It actually grounds truth. And so the legacy of that dissident thought that I want to kind of leave you with that I think is relevant today is the idea that truth is active, that truth and subject are linked through responsibility, that truth involves seeking and searching, but it is no less real. For all that, you don't give up on its reality. In 2008, during one of their very last conversations before Václav Havel's death, Adam Miknik asked Havel, what advice would you have for a young person today who asks you, how should I live? And Havel answered, the fundamental imperative, live in truth. Thank you. Well, Marcy, uh, we thank you. Um, uh, I like this ex expression of yours, uh, to walk us through. <laughs> you, you always say, I will walk you through. <laughs> and then we start off uh, somewhere, and uh, we end somewhere else, <laughs> and you have walked us through. And you did, in fact. Descartes, Kant, Hegel, Marx, uh, Lukács, uh, Arendt, uh, Patochka, Kolwakowski, <laughs> Uh, uh, and a lot of the shadow of Nietzsche in the background, mm -hmm. as it should be. Uh, I think that was that was uh, quite a, a quite impressive and long tour. Um, let let me start with one uh, remark uh, at the beginning. This will give you s some time. We still have some time for discussion. Let me start with one remark at the beginning. You were speaking about the grand narratives. Uh, that was um, we could say mm -hmm. what you were tackling: the the question of the possibility or impossibility of the grand narratives. And if I try to, to sum up your talk, I think there were also two grand narratives, or what one could describe as like two great ideas, mm -hmm. two great theses. The first one is uh, that about um, uh, the difference of modernity and postmodernity. Mm -hmm. you, you sum up modernity with the one sentence, it's uh, the attempt to replace God mm -hmm. with something else. God, in that sense, obviously, uh, is a metaphor for like mm. something like an ultimate authority mm. or an absoluteness. So there can be an ultimate, this is a time where there still can be an ultimate decision about uh, wrong and right, about true and false, mm. about yes and no. Uh, although this, th this instance is not God any longer, but there is no doubt that it exists. Postmodernity then is, the, uh, is e giving even uh, that up and does not even make the attempt to find a replacement, mm. to find a surrogate. My first question is, what um, does really follow from that? I mean, you, you made it very clear, that was my provocative statement in the beginning, uh, that uh, Jacques Derrida is not to be blamed for uh, mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin. You made clear that, you, <laughs> that this is not, you, not your point of view. Mm -hmm. But what does follow from it? I mean, what, what, what is this critique of postmodernity? How would you, how would you mm -hmm. phrase it for today, for us? And this is the first narrative, and then I think the second narrative that is somewhat built into this, this, this big, big approach is that about the difference of East and West. Uh, in, in the beginning I said that this Central European, Central Eastern European region, that is what your, ver what your work is very much focusing on. And uh, I think this is what you also tried to make clear in your talk, not very openly all the time, but I think it was there, that you are somewhat turning things around. I mean, in, in intellectual history, cultural history, 
we always see like the West as the forerunner and the East like lagging behind and trying to follow up. I remember two weeks ago we had this discussion on, on Czech cubism, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a very uni unique mm -hmm. thing. And it is always o only considered to be like derivative, mm -hmm. secondary. It is always like behind the Paris mm -hmm. cubism, which in fact maybe is not true. But anyway, this, mm -hmm. is, this is how it is perceived. And you somewhat turn things around. Mm -hmm. And if, if that is right, what you're saying, if I understood you correctly, you're, you're telling us uh, there is the post-68 experience of uh, the East has to tell us a lot in the West. Mm -hmm. And so it is the East who is the avant-garde here. And if that is true, if there is some common background, some common experience for all so-called Eastern European, mm -hmm. Eastern Central European philosophers, where does it derive from and what does it have to do with I mean, the obvious answer is uh, communism. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, how would you try to, how would you try to, to um, phrase it? Um, what, what, what does really uh, change their point of view so decisively that one can speak about one Eastern European experience? And as an assumption, does it maybe have to do with the question of secularization because mm. you're speaking about God? Mm. And, uh, it, as I said in the beginning, this is obviously in some sense a metaphor, but on the other hand, you can also take it quite literally. Does it have to do with, a f let, let's say, like forced secularization mm. that Eastern Europe was thrown into? I'll stop here and give you a first one, and then we open up for all of you, and we have, as I said, some 20, 25 minutes, obviously, for discussion. Please. Oh, wow. Well, those, are, those are lots of good questions. Okay. Um, yes, I do, and I, I describe it to my students this way a lot. You know, I, I do think that's the critical break between modernity and postmodernity. When you give up, mm -hmm. you give up on trying to replace God and say there, there's not going to be any transcendental signified. There's no ultimate authority. There's no unifying first principle that's going to hold everything together. There's no God. There's no replacement God, and so that's incredible liberation. But also, it's a kind of free fall. Um, and I think in some ways, I understand it as you know, a, another version or a more developed version or a you know, later version of what the avant-garde experiences in the 1910s and 1920s. Like this idea that, okay, you know, God is dead, you know, and the consequences of that have to be, you know, interpreted as radically as possible if any compensation is to be made for the loss. And the avant-garde that took so seriously Nietzsche's idea that, you know, what is falling, we should still push. Um, and that you, you make this leap into ultimate freedom in which anything is possible. But that ultimate freedom, that radical freedom is radical nothingness because there's nothing to hold on to. You know, it's like those rides at the amusement park where they just drop you and it's thrilling but it's terrifying. Not that I have ever gone on one of these. I'm only, yeah, I can, my, my, my brother and sister-in-law go on them and describe it to me sometimes, but that's how I imagine it, like this kind of free fall. So it's both like you jump or you fall and it's, it's ecstatic you know, and it's liberating because there are no more role, rules. But it's also terrifying because there's nothing to hold on to. You know, and that, that radical freedom, that's radical nothingness, that comes out in a different version in Satra, um, that space for self-creation is, is precisely nothingness. Freedom is nothingness. Um, and, and we see that, you know, in postmodernity. I see what is, I love teaching Derrida, like I love teaching Foucault, and I see what is so exciting and what's so liberating, and especially when I was in graduate school in the 1990s, and there were like the big debates in the department between the postmodernists and the anti-postmodernists, and I was very decisively on the postmodernist side, because I just, I love the creative possibilities of it. I love this idea that language could undermine itself, that things were never exactly what they seemed to be that there was always something tense and moving under the surface that could be somehow unraveled. It just opened up all these possibilities. But I also see how that, that groundlessness, that Bodenlosigkeit, that unhinging, is, is terrifying. I was trying to find, I was giving a seminar on Alexander Vought in Poland last week, I was trying to translate unhinging into Polish, and that was the word I couldn't like, I couldn't quite get in Polish with unhinging. Um, that, that infinite possibilities. And I didn't, it, it's not like I was particularly perspicacious in the 1990s. I saw how this could be turned around into something that could be weaponized by an authoritarian Russian leader. I didn't have any particular, you know, precocious insight in, into that. 
But when I when I saw what was happening, you know, and and then when I when I read Pierre Pomerantsev's book and I and I turned on Russia Today, I thought, okay, this is fascinating because it's not that there used to be propaganda, now there's truth. But there's also not propaganda in the same sense as it was, you know, in communist times or in Soviet times. And then I was asking like my Russian friends and my, my friends from Eastern Europe to try to like, who, who were old enough to remember the communist period, to try to like describe to me how it felt differently. And then I had Russian colleagues who were saying, well, you know, back in Soviet times, you turned on the television and you knew what you were going to hear. You know, you knew that the story wasn't true, but the story was consistent from one day to the next. And it was logical, you know, it was internally logical and it was coherent. And so if you were familiar with it, you knew what was coming. Whereas now you're in this free for all where one day Turkey is our greatest enemy and the next day Turkey is our best friend and one day this and one day that and, and anything could happen at any given moment and all the rules can change. And there's no reason for anyone to be consistent at all. Then I'll, I can describe this one episode of Russia Today that I saw that at the beginning of the war of the Donbass. Um, and this was, this was an English episode of, of RT. And the host on this English episode of RT was this young American guy who seemed to be about 25 and spoke approximately five words of bad Russian. I mean, he really made me feel great about my Russian, which I normally feel terrible about when I saw that he's hosting this Russian program and doesn't really speak any Russian. And it was, it, ostensibly responding to accusations that there were Russian soldiers in the Donbass, which of course there were, but you know, officially there weren't. You know, and so the episode was not giving you an alternative story about how we can prove there were no Russian soldiers in the Donbass. Instead, you have this kind of comically incompetent, you know, 25-year-old American who appears to be in the Donbass during the war, although who knows where he really is. And he's like, today we're going to talk about stories I'm hearing that there are Russian soldiers in the Donbass. And I keep hearing these stories, so I thought today I'll go look for some Russian soldiers in the Donbass, and you're all going to see what we find out. And I'm really excited to see what we're going to find out. And look, there are some guys in camouflage. Let's go over and ask them where they're from. And then he kind of wanders over, and he's like, dra, dra, a pri, priyat, priyat, you know, vi, ruski. And they kind of shake their head, and he's like, I don't know, these guys don't seem to be Russian, but, 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 but who knows, like, let, let's keep kind of walking down the street and, oh, look, there's some more guys in camouflage, maybe they're Russians, let's go talk to them. And, you know, it's like, V, 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 Ruski? And they're like, and they're like, I don't know, these guys don't seem to be Russian either. I mean, I keep hearing that there are all these Russians here, and who knows, maybe in some other neighborhood. And so it's not really like you're getting a powerful story that there are no Russian soldiers in the Donbass. <laughs> I mean, you're getting some like, how are we ever supposed to know anything? You know, and that's a very like, I mean, I do think there's something to this d difference between kind of propaganda in the grand narrative sense and this kind of, you know, postmodern, you know, anything could be possible. And I became very interested in how that different thing was, Marcy, was operating. Marcy, I suggest we leave the, the answer to the okay. second question for later. <laughs> and we now s start with Louisa. Would you very, very briefly yeah. introduce you, Louisa? Yeah. Well. Hi, um, my name is Luisa Vyashevich and I'm a visiting guest here yeah. and a political geographer by training. Yeah. And first, thank you so much yeah. for your wonderful lecture and thank you for quoting Hannah Arendt because that very quote, I was kind of replaying it in my mind as yeah. you were saying it, I use it to open my course on European geopolitics. Oh. And I tell my students, this is what you need to know mm -hmm. about how geopolitical narratives have always been framed. And so I think it is really a powerful way of understanding how modern, but I would also argue kind of contemporary mm. political narratives are framed. And one of the things that you note, and here will come the first part of my question, is that what matters, as you said, it's not facts or invented facts, right, but the system of which they are part, mm. because that's what allows a political leader, um, mm. a geopolitical theorist, to move from that fortuitousness into consistency. Mm. And she argues that that happens through repetition, mm. right? So through constant repetition mm. um, in, you know, kind of um, popular media and, you know, in, in discourse. So I guess the question would be, how does that work today? Mm. And you said that, you know, it's, it's quite different to mm. look at the way in which narratives are woven today because there is this, well, you know, anything is possible. Yeah. 
But anything is possible is also a narrative, a very mm. powerful one. I mean, it's the one of a chaotic world when everything is unknowable in a sense. So, I mean, I, I guess I would argue that that is also a consistent yeah. narrative. So th that would be the first question. Um, and I guess the second one goes to my need to recover poor Derrida. Yeah. Um, as somebody who I, I believe is a profoundly <coughs> ethical, political mm. thinker. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the very strong stance that he took, just as Sigmund Bauman did, um, during the Bush years, and mm. specifically reacting to the American um, invasion of Iraq in mm. 2003, noting how, you know, what Europeans had to do was to resist precisely these grand totalizing mm. narratives and his solution. And he wrote um, about it actually with um, Elizabeth Rodinesco um, was, a, you know, kind of was something was, was rethinking the political geopolitical subject around the idea of subjectivity, which is exactly what you were mon uh, mentioning and thinking of Europe specifically as a seeking subject, as one aware mm. of its own subjectivity, aware of its place of the, in the world, opposed to, mm. you know, kind of the American subject, unwilling to recognize um, and, you know, kind of what, what it was and what it was doing and very much, you know, kind of framed in these totalizing visions. So um, I guess the question is if we can recover him <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Should I answer that, or are you going to take? Yeah. Oh no, thank you for that. Yes, I, I mean I think there, there's also an argument to be made. No, thank you very much for that. I think there's also an argument to be made for studying the late Derrida, um, and, and I'm not an expert on him. But I like when I look back now and think about even essays like on cosmopolitanism and on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my my intuition is that at some point he he got nervous about the unwanted implications of some of his own ideas. I mean, he like, I, I feel in the late, and I'm not an expert on him, but I feel in the late Derrida kind of desire for an ethical grounding, you know, in a more urgent way than I, than I feel in, in the younger one. Um, and I'm, I'm very empathetic to that. And I also think the nature of ideas is such that we never know where they're going to go. I mean, Arendt calls this in the human condition, right? The boundlessness of human interrelatedness. You know, we act, you know, and to speak is to act, and you never know how that will play out. You know, there are always the unintended consequences. Um, and I do think, like, and especially when I read the late Derrida, I mean, I do think that, that he was someone who was very concerned with ethics. And I think those, those essays on forgiveness and cosmopolitanism are quite beautiful. Um, Wait, what was that? What else was I? Oh yes, Arendt. I, I mean, I I always love talking about Arendt. Um, yeah, there there's a long tradition in Central Europe that whenever things get very dark and creepy, you start saying Tsuruk su Kant, um, which is probably it's a good moment Tsuruk su Kant. But I really like when Trump won the election. I was like, okay, Tsuruk su Arendt. You know, <laughs> it's a Tsuruk su Arendt kind of moment. I redid all my classes so that we were like all graduate students, undergraduates, freshmen. We were all going to walk through Origins of Totalitarianism carefully. Um, no, I, I absolutely have that feeling. Um, the question of is, can this unknowableness be spun into its own kind of consistent narrative is a really good question. I mean, that's, and I feel like I'm still trying to kind of figure this, this out. I mean, in some sense, I feel like I'm still looking at my own country thinking, well, how, I mean, how is this happening? And how are people thinking, you know? And why do they, why do they believe this? I was, and I was in Eastern Ukraine a couple weeks ago, and in Dnipro, people were saying about like their friends and family and acquaintances on the other side of the border who took the other side in the war in the Donbas. Well, you know, Marcy, you don't understand because like you didn't live here then, but you know, we are so vulnerable, you know, to this kind, to all of these stories that there was a CIA-sponsored coup and people are coming to kill all the Russian speakers because there was this, you know, that, that's the Soviet legacy. That's a continuation of Homo Sovieticus, and we were never taught to think for ourselves. And you in the West can never understand what that lack of a democratic tradition does to mentality. You know, and I, I listen to all that and I take it seriously. But then how do you explain Pizzagate? I mean, how do you explain, you know, Americans believing that Hillary Clinton was kidnapping children to exploit for a child pornography ring, stashing them in the basement of a pizza parlor in Washington? I mean, even more ludicrous. 
than you know, the CIA conspiracy theory in Kiev. And there was no Soviet legacy in the States. You can't talk about Homo Sovieticus. We have arguably a rich democratic tradition. So how, like, how do you explain the power of that craziness? And I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> So I think we have more. Please, yeah. Would you yes. also shortly introduce yourself? Okay. Um, yes, hello. My name is Leo Finteisen. I've been teaching, um, let's say, new media, what programming changes in the production of fine arts here in Vienna, but uh, that is not my point. Uh, one of my... my um, yeah, but but, but uh, I, I'm researching at the moment uh, what media formats and what social network formats mm -hmm. make possible uh, the minimal freedom under pressure mm. in prison, in totalitarianism, in little countries that have new generic devices that uh, control the soul out of everybody, <laughs> because the whole history is uh, with one little uh, bureaucrat. What I wanted to say is that in the in the mid 80s, uh, I had one year where I was as as a lot of West Europeans, I could be in seven European countries with one passport control, mm. and then at the same time, because uh, I was born in Germany, uh, we had relatives, and we had eight passport controls to uh, to have our relatives uh, being visited in Leipzig, for instance, mm. and uh, and and I want to come to the. Uh, what sort of modernity did they see, postmodernity mm -hmm. did they see, and how do we compare that to today's Polish young people, Russian young people? So um, they told me that it was not only that you couldn't believe uh, or you knew what would need to be said in the normal media, but they had the special situation that they could um, the broadcast of the Western television mm -hmm. was was a trick also by the West. Yeah, to make stronger senders and so on. Um, and but then there was the second thing, the Stasi, the Spitzel. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the the postwoman would knock against the door, and and uh, really uh, talk in the worst sense about the government. And they knew, oh, this is a trap. If we now say, oh, Honecker really, you know, is too old f to run the country, then they might have problems and their children might not get right. into school and so on. So today it's not like that, I guess. I know the Russian internet is differently controlled than, than ours. Mm -hmm. I know that the Russian young people can travel, but still there is, there is a danger of going too far. But I see a lot of people being very courageous mm -hmm. there in a way that I couldn't uh, imagine being able to my female cousins in the GDR at the time. Yeah? They just hoped to get through, yeah. but they didn't openly uh, until 86 or something started to, to get. So how, what is the difference in post-truth mm -hmm. management by the now, let's say, open border mm -hmm. uh, tyranny or <laughs> control mm -hmm. society? Yeah, in if I compare it to eighty-five or even sixty-seven, or thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Now, these are great questions. I, I don't have adequate answers, but they're questions I'm thinking of. Um, one of the things that I was fascinated me about the Maidan that I, I explore in the book, although I explore in the sense of opening the question without decisively answering it, is the relationship between subjectivity and transparency in connection with the internet and social media. So one thing that struck me about the Maidan was what, what did it mean for people to set up cameras so that people could watch you being shot in real time? What did it mean that the only way to assert your own narrative, your own selfhood against that of an official narrative was to turn the cameras on yourself? was to violate any kind of private space. That kind of that dialectic, that the precondition for the assertion of subjectivity became the self-violation of the self, um, that, that was somehow illuminated for me on the Maidan. I have no answer to it, but I think the question is, is key. Um, and I, I think that relates more generally to the sense in which social media, I mean, and 
and anecdotally watching how social media has functioned among friends and colleagues in, in extreme situations in war now or in revolution, it's both a lifeline and a panopticon. You know, it's it's often it's the only thing that prevents being totally cut off or alienated or disappearing that that keeps any kind of connection with anyone you know who might help you or who loves you or who cares about you and it's also the thing that turns the panopticon on you so that you have no private space and no way of filtering infinite amounts of material now how that dialectic operates too i i don't think we've we obviously haven't seen it play itself out to the end and it seems like very new territory for me um, and I, I watch it with kind of fascination and, and terror um, now the other question connected to that that I think you were asking about in connection to the communist period that was brought back to mind again somewhat during the Maidan but especially at the beginnings of the war in the Donbass is provocatia this kind of this old tradition of, of provocation and the English word doesn't really capture the Slavic usage and that's that's definitely not new to postmodernism I mean it's not it wasn't even new to communism provocatia has a long history going back to the Russian Empire at least that people are set up to pretend to be other people to pretend to to encourage people to do the thing that would then like allow you to arrest them or to kill them or um, and and that that also started to seem to me like it had a kind of postmodern element. And you, like in the beginning of the war in the Donbass, when I was trying to figure out, okay, who is who? So who, you know, from these Russian tourists, you know, who's acting on their authentic inclinations? Who is being paid? Who is being paid to be on the side they're representing? Who is being paid to be on the other side to encourage the people on the other side to do something that will then justify cracking down on them? You know, who has who was originally given some material incentive but has now lost a sense of the script and gotten caught up in their role? Who no longer knows who is who or why they're doing what they're doing? They're just somehow going along with the momentum of the moment. Um, and there was this feeling that this, that provocatio on a large scale, you know, leads to a kind of, you know, disso like crisis of subjectivity. How do you know who is who? And do the people around you know who is who? And there's this moment in a, um, a book by a, a fantastically talented young Polish journalist named Pawel Panjanjek, who covered the war in the Donbass for the first three years. And he describes, you know, being there, and, and he's a foreigner, he's a young Pole, you know, and, and people are coming up to him in these towns, you know, as the war's starting and people are shooting and they're saying, Nashi, Nashi, like, are they our guys? Are they on our side? And he's thinking, okay, like, what, what does ours mean? What is like, are they on our, what do they mean by Nashi? What do they mean by, are they on our side? Who do they conceive of as being on our side, as being on their side? And do they even know what that means? Um, and I... Marcy? Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, no, no, but no, no, I think we have to stop it. I, I have at least long. three more questions. Okay. So my suggestion, we, we collect all three of them, yeah. so that we as, at least those who have told me already that we can... <laughs> Now this is number four. <laughs> so we, now we collect all four of them. But the precondition is I don't say it to anybody personally. So I look, <laughs> I look up and say, please be short <laughs> with the questions and remarks. And now we collect all four. Okay, we start here, please. <laughs> yeah, I have already three points. Mm. But uh, brief uh, ones, brief ones. Th this is exactly what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> The first is with regard to seeking the truth. Mm. So you know the German author and philosopher Lessing, who already in the 18th century said, there is God with two hands. <laughs> and in one hand he says, there is truth. In the other, one, in the other hand, he has seeking the truth. Mm. And, and he offers to Lessing to choose. And Lessing says to God, I choose seeking the truth. Mm. So apparently the truth as such was not so important or was not the first importance for Lessing, but he preferred seeking the truth. Yeah. My second point is regarding what you said on responsibility. You may know that Jean-Paul Sartre had a very famous sentence mm. saying people should be responsible for all things which happen. 
So whether this is realistic or not is a different matter. But the idea of responsible, of a very broad overall responsi responsibility is also not so new and it is a Western concept also, not an Eastern one. And my last one is a real question. Uh, the a priori knowledge. That, that was a fair remark. <coughs> the, a priori, the a priori knowledge, <laughs> is it in your mind truth or not? Okay, we continue right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. It's been really interesting. I'm a student of science and studies at the University of Vienna, an international student, and it's a very concrete question. Uh, do you see specific instances of weaponizing the notion of post truth? Uh, on institutions dominated by the left, such as the university. So do you think it could be also weaponized on the left side of the political mm -hmm. spectrum? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good question. And we continue with Agnieszka in the back. <coughs> I'd also like to thank for this wonderful journey. And my question uh, is the following. Uh, anthropologist Jonathan Friedman has just published a book entitled Politically Correct. Mm -hmm. And actually in the introduction of the book he's saying me, uh, like I, this left-wing anthropologist, I would never expect to write this book. And I wrote it after I moved to Sweden and I worked at the University of Stockholm, where one day the head of the department told us, you are not allowed to publish any uh, bad information about Muslim immigrants. We need to hide it from the public. Mm. And he said, aren't we, start, aren't we the good side starting to produce the mm. fake news too? And I'm mentioning his book. It, it's uh, it's there, are of course, like uh, it can be criticized in many ways, but I'm mentioning this book because I found so inspiring what you said about your enchantment with, with postmodernism, with the idea of postmodernism being so open and so creative. And what Friedman is saying, because he's also saying postmodernism was supposed to defend pluralism, but actually it forgets about this creativity because it establishes certain meanings what yeah. is good, what is bad, and it li he links it with political correctness. And I'm just curious what you think about that, but you don't have to answer. And the second uh, point I just want to make very shortly about this good, bad side of producing bad news, uh, uh, fake news. Um, as, I, as, as some of you know, I'm currently doing research on neo-fascism, and I just mm -hmm. participated in the anniversary of the March on Rome. And to, to celebrate this amazing anniversary, the Italian movement I'm studying decided to inaugurate a new blog where they publish a lot of information. And when I interviewed the person responsible for the blog and I asked what is the main idea, is it about educating new people, is it about spreading Mussolini's thought, he said, very, very seriously, like, we need to fight against all those fake news coming, people deserve to get to know true information. And I know that we can of course yeah. say yes, this is what the like, neo-fascists and bad guys are saying, but we should probably also re realize that they like genuinely think that there is like fake news coming mm. from the other side and this is what inspires certain people to join them. And it's pr because partly and perhaps partly the faculty of the University of Stockholm censoring some information yeah. about trying to problematize certain things is responsible for that. So that's just my comment, but thank you again for an amazing talk. So we have one last question. Marcy, you have a Piotr Filipkowski, Polish Academy of Sciences and Vienna University at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, lecture. Uh, I will try to be very, very uh, brief. I think that there is... Uh, uh, not only the problem of truth that you mentioned, or maybe even this is the, not the main one, uh, but the problem of, of uh, storytelling. Uh, mm, because many of the examples are kind of nominalistic about glass, about something, uh, we are, how many people are in the room, and so on. And okay, there are fake news about this as well. Someone was shot or was not, or by whom, uh, in what uniform. These are fake news on this very basic nominalistic level. And there is a relatively easy way to uh, logically at least, or, or uh, intellectually, to, to grasp it. But the, the, the problem is, and I would illustrate it with one name only, Hayden White, the problem how to come from small no, uh, analytic sentences to big stories. Uh, that and, and I think this is even much bigger problem than the, 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 the problem of, of, of truth, no truth, on this, on this, mm -hmm. on this uh, simple or more complex uh, level. And, uh, 
and I think we there is no solution also in your in your uh, talk uh, how to cope with this because if we, we, we are overwhelmed with, with facts even with true facts and how to make true stories out of them and what does it mean I think we we don't really know and how to convince to these stories other people who are bombarded with with tr truths and fake news and and uh, and fake stories and some maybe small true stories and so on so so there is a level in between uh, this is one point and another is a one more example to your many examples uh, to this as if uh, or this, this this moral fundament or ethical fundament i would i would give example of of Czesław Miłosz a poem who in one of his poems says that uh, if there is no god you shouldn't tell to your brother that there is no god in in very you know uh, ad hoc translation uh, there is one line of the poem and it doesn't have to be god there could be a sense the meaning the 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 responsibility the ethics uh, and, and many things that that we are talking uh, you you were you are talking about um, and and okay one interpretation could be this is very paternalistic because uh, I know there is no God but I don't tell to the other uh, but how to and I think this was the direction of your uh, uh, recovering or rescuing the reader from this critic that was there as well um, th this ethical point how to how it basically maybe this is a question not about truth but about ethics how to make a f fundament of ethics on which should we should we should we um, build it uh, uh, on truth it, it it seems to be complicated still uh, <laughs> uh, on what i don't know but but it, i don't think the truth really is the main point here uh, um, i think it was but the ethics the, the responsibility <laughs> yeah, the story and the ethics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think for a talk like this, the final reference should always be to Czesław Miłosz. <laughs> so that was that was great, and that was already a very, it could have been a, a great final word. But we give the opportunity to Marcy the impossible task to answer. If I did not miscount uh, six questions, I guess. <sighs> Uh, so, good luck. Okay, um, <laughs> I, I can't give them adequate answers. I will try to say a few things. First of all, thank you for the lessing story. No, that's beautiful. Um, Sartre, I know exactly what sentence you're talking about in Sartre. There's a moment <coughs> in his 1946 lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism, which in many ways is a very kind of deeply no notion of the, the, the lonely individual, in which he says that when you take responsibility for making a choice, in fact, you are taking responsibility as if you were choosing on behalf of all men. And every year when I teach that, my students say, that's totally inconsistent with everything else he's saying in the essay. You know, and I, and I, I agree with them, and it's a very provocative point. It's an extremely Kantian moment in what is not a terribly Kantian text. I mean, it's almost a kind of version of the categorical imperative, like you always have to ask yourself what would, hap what would happen if everyone were going to act the way I'm going to act, um, which I, I think is very inconsistent with the rest of what he's saying. But the, the, way, the relationship between Sartre and East European dissident philosophy is very interesting, and I have a lot to say about it, but I, I Ludger's giving I you this look like... I liked your remark on the Lessing uh, thing. <laughs> 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 right. Okay. Um, I will table that conversation for another time. Uh, as, as, as a proud Slavicist, I, am, I, I will continue to insist that Eastern Europe is not merely derivative of what was happening in the West. Um, but I, I, I'm also a fan of Sartre's. Um, is a priori truth truth? Is rational truth truth? Um, of course, I have nothing against it. I'm, I'm all for mathematics. Um, <laughs> I'm not anti-mathematics. <laughs> um, I mean, Arendt also did not mean to dismiss those kinds of truths. She was only trying to clarify that what she was talking about was a certain kind of truth that was vulnerable to contingency mm -hmm. in a way that certain kinds of laws of physics or math are not vulnerable to contingency. Um, can can postmodernism be weaponized by the left? Of course. I mean, of course, um, yes. Um, I, there's there's no monopoly in in that sense. Um, 
responsibility, let me see if I manage to get all these things down, responsibility for truth seeking. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things that Natalia Rudakova cites in this book, and again, this isn't my research, it's, it's a new book that came out, I, I just read it, um, it was years in the making, is various public opinion surveys in which Russians essentially say, we don't mind if the journalists aren't telling the truth. We expect them not to tell the truth, we don't have a huge problem with that. You know, it seems reasonable to us that they're not always going to tell the truth. So the sense that you just kind of, there's, you, you kind of give up, you know, and how much of that is a desire to embrace plurality, you know, and how much of it is an abdication of responsibility for truth seeking, you know, is a provocative question. And how are those things related? You know, I'm, I'm very empathetic to that desire to embrace multiple perspectives, you know, and plurality, you know, and fluidities of subjectivity, you know, and at what point does that become an abdication of responsibility, you know, or is that a line or are those things always present? I don't have any magical answers to any of these things. I can only kind of lay out the questions um, in a talk like this. Um, I guess the thing I would end on, um, I, I recently read, um, actually at three in the morning when my eight-year-old woke me up because he had a cold and was coughing and then I couldn't get back to sleep, um, I read Karl Schlegel's um, Laudatio for Martin Pollock, um, who just got this big literary award. And, and Karl Schlegel, I mean, is, he's a wonderful historian, he's also a very beautiful writer, and this Laudatio was particularly poetic. You know, and I'm also a great fan of Martin Pollock's. And, and, and Martin Pollock, for those of you who don't know him, he's, he's an Austrian author. Um, he, he's, yeah, he's a philologist. He's a translator of Polish literature into German. Um, and he's a longtime journalist who specializes in Eastern Europe. You know, and there are many wonderful things you could say about him. But I think it's not a coincidence that in this Laudatio in particular, Karl Schlegel really returned to Martin's gift for empirical description and for a kind of exhaustive empirical description, both as a journalist and as a writer. Because that kind of slow, careful attention to detail, scene setting, you know, going to the place and noting the kind of the, the physical, factual details, I do worry that that's a lot of what's been lost, um, not only because there's fake news and a lack of, of perhaps responsibility for truth seeking, but also because of the sheer speed of the internet and the pressure of producing things very quickly, that the time that's required for that kind of pure empiricism, when you're just there, you know, not necessarily analyzing or drawing a conclusion, or that comes later, but just describing empirically what you see and what's going on, that, that that's becoming a kind of lost art. I think it's not a coincidence that, that Carl chose to stress that in his very beautiful poetic way, and it was very well deserved um, by Martin. And I have had this feeling that, you know, Husserl goes to Prague in 1935 to give the lectures he can no longer give in Nazi Germany because he's a non-Aryan, you know, and basically says only philosophy, you know, and the possibility of absolute truth, philosophically achieved absolute truth can save us now. And then Martin Heidegger famously says in the interview he gives to Der Spiegel in 1966 and allows to be published only after his death, you know, only a god can save us now. And recently I've had this feeling that, you know, only the journalist can save us now. And really like the kind of the old fashioned empirical journalist, you know, who actually take the time to describe what's going on, you know, and to describe before they even draw conclusions or before they analyze, you know, or before they, you know, they pull out various, you know, modes of pathos or fantasy or implotment but that some kind of return to the art of empiricism or the appreciation for empirical description, you know, a, as a mode of truth seeking, or as at least a first level of truth seeking, um, that perhaps it might be only the journalist who can save us now. Can we take this as the almost final word? Yes, yes. You can so only the word. journalist can save us. Uh, wait, wait, wait. So uh, there, there, is, there will be an end to this soon, but there's always something after the end. So after the end of this, you're invited uh, to our cafeteria downstairs, where we invite you for a glass of wine and some uh, cheese. So join us on that. And thanks to all of you for being with us tonight. Thanks for your patience. And thank you very much for... Um, 
uh, your questions and comments that, that I think very nicely reflected uh, the wide scope of uh, Marcy's talk and uh, that was re really wonderfully that it somewhat reappeared in the discussion, the, the variety of things that uh, Marcy was packing. And for Marcy, and this is my very final word, I just have a very short s sentence of gratefulness. Mm -hmm. Marcy, thank you for walking us through. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.